Okay, bonjour à tous. Bienvenue au séminaire de génie physique. On a le plaisir d'avoir avec nous uh, Francesca Marchetti. Francesca did her PhD at Scuola Normale, one of these bastions of wonderful physics in Italy. And she then went on to do a postdoc at Cambridge in the theory of condensed matter with uh, Peter Littlewood at first, and then as a research fellow with one of these prestigious EPSRC research fellowships, which are sort of a, a jumping or a platform towards a full-time faculty position. And she spent a few more years at Cambridge, then moved on to Oxford University, and then received another prestigious fellowship to continue um, as a junior group leader in Spain at the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, where she is now. And uh, Francesca will tell, her, tell us about her recent work on Fermi polarons in 2D semiconductors. So before this, she did uh, her, she, her expertise is in light matter interaction in semiconductors. She's done a lot of pioneering work on interaction of light with semiconducting quantum wells and micro cavities. But we'll learn about a new topic today. So Francesca, the mic is yours. I'll turn off my microphone. And uh, anybody on Zoom, you can write in uh, your questions on the chat window and we can stop Francesca if needed. Is it okay if we interrupt you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Okay, so we can do that. And then questions from the audience, I'll just turn on the microphone and jump in. Okay, Francesca, the mic is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for this invitation, Stefan. It's a pleasure and an honor. I never gave a talk to such a big audience online. It's very exciting. And um, you told me, I mean, I've been told that this is a is a seminar for students, first year graduate students. So that's how I target it. So please feel comfortable to interrupt me anytime. This should be like an informal discussion, like a presentation of something we have been interested in the last year or so. And, um, and uh, yeah, please, Stefan, if you can read the chat, because from here, if I put the chat, then I will not see my screen. So it will be confusing for me. So, so yeah, interrupt me anytime you want. And 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 I'll, I'll stop. So so yeah. So what are Fermi polarons into these semiconductors? This is something we have been curious about for a year or so. And to start, uh, let me tell you about like an old problem. So oops, let's see if I can. Yeah. So polarons are something ubiquitous in quantum physics, and and the idea of polaron goes back to Landau. So almost a century ago, in 1933 and Pecker, a bit later, that were describing electrons in a dielectric medium. So, and later, which is what this figure refers to, is um, the problem considered by Froelich, where he considered the motion and the behavior of an electron in a crystal. So, in general, a polaron is an impurity, so it's an impurity problem, which is surrounded by a quantum uh, gas, a quantum bath. So for this problem, the bath would be phonons and the properties of the impurity, so the electron change because the impurity get dressed by uh, excitation of collective excitation of the medium. So, um, so that's what a, a polaron is, and it's absolutely astonishing that after almost a century, uh, this problem attracts lots of attention. So there are, as I said, is ubiquitous. There is the Kondo problem, uh, falls in this category, helium-3, helium-4, uh, and many other. And very recently, with the advent of cold atoms, uh, this problem uh, is also seeing an upsurge of um, interest. So in, in cold atoms, which is something I will not talk about, you have a, a neutral atom in an internal spin state, let's say this red spin down uh, particle, which is the impurity surrounded by a bath of other neutral atoms of the same species or not, that doesn't matter. So in another state, which can be either bosonic or fermionic. So the beauty of cold atoms is that you can tune the interaction between the impurity and the bath. And what has been observed, and, and schematically I have represented in this um, figure, is the dressing of the impurity by particle hole excitation of the bath, which result in two solutions, which one is called the attractive polaron. So schematically it would be like the a lower energy solution where the bath is attracted to the impurity and the repulsive polaron solution. So 
Okay, though I'm very fond of cold atoms, I, we were looking uh, into this problem in 2D semiconductors, where it's a bit different. So um, there, I will try to explain step by step what this structure is, but basically the idea is that you have a 2D electron gas or a 2D all gas, which are these green particles or charge. So if you have a charge Fermi bath, and the impurity is a photon generated electron hole pair, which is also called exciton. We will explain that. And in these systems, you have in addition the possibility to strongly couple the system to light, so a photon. So, so why you might wonder, I mean, we should start why this is relevant. Why should you care about such a problem which has been studied? Why and what is new respect to the Landau original problem? So, um, so in able, in able, to be able to explain this, what I'm going to do to start with is to explain how basically the system, how the system are, uh, are built. No? So how, how, I mean, what are the components of this schematic picture where you have different um, structure? So, okay, so let me start from this and I will explain, let me start from this yellow, um, uh, slab, which is the active medium, and uh, and the active medium, I've considered the case of uh, transition metal decalcogenides uh, monolayers, uh, not because it's the only example, but just because they are emerging as 2D materials, which are tremendously pro promising for uh, nanophotonic devices and easy integration. Um, yeah, and, and integration. So, and they have remarkable optical properties as I'm going to explain. So what is a TMD, transition metal decalcogenal monolayer? So this is, is a layer, which is hexagonally arranged of um, a metal atom and have another layer and on top and on the bottom of also hexagonally arranged uh, transition um, no, but um, calcogen layers. So, okay, for us, this structure doesn't matter so much. Well, it's like, a, we would say it's like graphene. So the brilliant zone is hexagonal as well, but what it does matter is that at the K, what is called KK prime point of this uh, system, you have a band structure. So I only plotted the valence band and the conduction bands, then you have other conduction bands and other valence bands, which are not important for what I'm going to say, which are in the monolayer limit, um, which experimentally is, is reached, for example, by exfoliation, um, you have a direct band up. So, so it means that the maximum of the valence band is on top of the minimum of the conduction band. And the important property is that you have what is called the valley spin uh, locking. So this means that basically you can, you can excite your system with a photon, but in the photon can be, have a circular polarization. This is correspond to like a spin, spin plus one if it's right polarized or spin minus one if it's left polarized. So in these structures, basically with the left polar, left, uh, right polarized light, you can only excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band at the, K, at the K point, leaving behind a hole. If instead you pump it with a, with a laser with left uh, circular polarization, then you excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band and leave behind the hole at the K prime point. And this is because you have these selection rules. So the spin is conserved. So you can associate the spin with this band and it's up for the K and down for the K prime in the case of TMD, like molybdenum biselenide, which is what I'm referring to. Okay, so that's that's also has potential, I mean, big potentialities, which we are not going to, um, I'm going, not going to talk about, but what I would like to tell you is that now the electron hole pair that you have generated, say by sigma plus, it's like an hydrogen atom. So, so it can attract, they attract each other and they can form a bound state. And this is what is called exciton. So an exciton is an electron and a hole pair. I will call it from now onwards one and two. 
one can be the electron and two can be the hole or the other way around. And phi, this is the wave function, the relative wave function, uh, hydrogenic wave function between the electron and the hole. So if you do absorption, which means, for example, you can see, you can shine a laser and see what gets absorbed. And what you see is a series of peaks. And this is exactly like the Rydberg series of a 2D hydrogen atom. This would be in 2D because this is a 2D systems. And the lowest state, which is the 1S, has a binding energy very, very, very big. This is 500 MeV. So it's far, by far much more uh, big than the room temperature, which means that these excitons are stable at room temperature. And of course, this is a huge potential for applications. OK, so the other properties that you should care about is what we call oscillator strength. In some sense, is the area of this peak. And this is, is related to the probability of the electron and hole to recombine. So if I take this wave function in momentum space and I, and I do the Fourier transform in real space, the strength by which the exciton couples to lie is the probability for the electron and hole to be on top of each other. So this relative position is zero and uh, modulus square. So either I do the Fourier transform in momentum space would be the sum one over the area for the sum. So the integral of the excitonic wave function. Great. So now, uh, and uh, of course, I mean, the exciton, which can be produced by light are S wave, which means that in reality, it doesn't depend on K as a vector in 2D, but just as a modulus of K. So it's a complete isotropic, as it should be for S states. So now let's add another, another component to this um, schematic uh, structure. And this component is a cavity. So what's a cavity? A cavity is just a mirror. So the fact that you can confine the photon in between two mirrors, I've plotted here as a stack of different materials. These are called distributed Bragg reflectors, but in fact, it can be other kinds of mirrors for what we are concerned, just that in between the photon is trapped and it will decay with a certain uh, decay rate. So what happened now inside the cavity? You have the photon that can excite an exciton and you can form a bound state, but after some time, the exciton can decay as a decay rate and create a photon. And so on, the photon can be absorbed and create an exciton. The exciton can decay and create a photon and so on and so forth. This process, if the mirror is perfect, will be infinite. So, so you, must, you can imagine that the quasi-particle inside the cavity is neither an exciton nor a photon. It's something which is a mixture. So it's an, it's an entangled mixture between these two. In reality, the mirror is not that perfect. So it, after some times, the photon can decay. But if the coupling strength between the two is bigger than the decay rate from the mirrors, then you form what is called a polariton, which is a superposition, an entangled state between a photon and an exciton. And we call it, for example, you can call the, this operator a P dagger, as if you use creation operators. So, okay, I'm taking this picture from, from a work from the chairman, so which is on, on molybdenum bisulfide, so another PMD monolayer in a cavity. And then you see that as a function of angle, if you do, I think this is must, maybe is the reflectance. So it means you see what it gets reflected when you pump weakly your system. And you do it as a function of the angle, the angle by which you uh, pump uh, your photon in. With this corresponds to the center of mass of this object. So you can see that if this is the energy of the exciton, which almost doesn't disperse on this on this scale, and and this is the energy of the photon, which in a cavity becomes quadratic, then reflectance shows you the eigenstates are neither the photon nor the exciton are these new states, which are characterized by a typical anticrossing. So it means that they are neither nor. So if they're completely in resonance at this crossing point, it means that this state, which is called lower polariton, is 50% matter and light. And this state, which is the upper polariton, is 
50%. So this is beautiful. I mean, is and actually polaritons are ubiquitous. I, we heard today a talk, actually it was, it was last, no, it was last week or two weeks ago in our department um, by um, someone called um, Timur Shengai that he was talking about that there are polaritons in water, uh, so in water droplets. So polaritons are ubiquitous, there are many, many, many examples. This is 2D heterostructure, semiconductor heterostructure are not the only examples. But in these systems, they have been achieved like uh, a huge number of like um, important results, both at the applicative, like, like device point of view and fundamental uh, system. So polaritons are light because they're mixed with light. So they're, they're not heavy, they're very light. They are fast, they're easy to excite because you can use an external laser. They are very easy to tune with the external laser and they are mixed with matter, so they interact. That's why for nonlinear optics, they are like really important um, uh, system. So the achievement that have been uh, obtained since the first realization of both and same condensate of polytons are uh, really too big to be numbered here. So, and they're very important, but uh, what I would like to tell you here briefly is that basically uh, the, the regime which has been by, by far mostly explored is a semi-classical regime where the phenomenology of this physics is the one of nonlinear classical waves. So very simply what, what it means, it means that you can pump your system with an external laser resonantly, but not only so, you can do it also not recently, but the net result is that you create so many polaritons, then adding one or removing one, it doesn't matter. So it becomes like a classical, semi-classical object. It's like a coherent state. So it loses the quantum, the quantumness. So this is not bad by per se, actually. There has been really a huge amount of achievements, but the field now is going towards the quest of quantum polaritons. So, so how to make this system quantum again? No, the word quantum as to start with. So, okay, so that's where this seminar goes. So, and this is where gating enters. So I added another, another ingredient to this schematic picture, which is a gate voltage, which helps you to basically introduce an electron gas or a whole gas in your system. And in the bands, it means you have a finite Fermi C. So the Fermi C usually is measured by the middle of the, of the conductor, I mean, here, but I mean, I put the band gap to zero. I mean, theorists usually put the band gap to zero. So I count it from the bottom. And when you increase, when you change your gating, it's like changing your chemical potential in your system. So if you change it here in between, you have a neutral system. But if you start putting your chemical potential here, it means you have electrons, electron gas. If you put it here, you have a whole gas. And the, in 2D, the Fermi energy is related to the density in this way. So, okay, then you can imagine saying, okay, wow, now I have, say, few more electrons. And aside from the exciton, that in this system have 500, more or less, MeV binding energy, then now I can have charged exciton, which are called triads, which, if you calculate, have a much lower binding energy. Okay, this is a few body description. What I would like to tell you today is instead, if you have a finite density of the, your Fermi gas, you shouldn't talk about in terms of exciton and trions. If EF is finite, then you should talk about polarons. And the right description is the one where you excite optically an electron hole pair interband, so in between the bands, and now the Fermi C can be dressed by intraband electron hole pairs. And that's a polar description. And this is the one which should be correct at finite EF. And the few body description is only correct when EF goes to zero. Okay, so, so that's what I would like to explain you. What are the difference between these two? And also what strong coupling to light can and cannot do to this system. Note, before I continue that, there is a big difference if you create, so I, I plotted here sigma plus exciton generated, 
but I can dress the Fermi C with particles in between the same uh, valley, so or opposite valley. And that makes a big difference as well, as we're going to see. Okay, so we can go back to the original question. Why, why should I care? You know, why, why are you telling me about this problem? Why is this problem interesting and exciting? And what are the perspectives? So, um, so the most important uh, what is what I already said. These are beyond already the dressing describes beyond mean field effects. So the creation of the exciton per se without the dressing, that is what I would call like a pairing phenomena. Even if you have a Fermi C, you can describe how the pairing of the exciton changes because of, of the Fermi C. And we have been working about this and I can tell you at another time, but the dressing is something intrinsically many body and quantum. So that is, it should give interesting effects. The second reason, which is basically the same, but stated in a different way, is that now if you see this cartoon from a paper uh, by the group of Imamoglu, if you have the, your exciton, which is photon generating, which can mix with light and form a polariton, which is a polar on polariton, uh, well, a polariton, and then the, the, the electron Fermi gas around the impurity can change its shape. It can either get attracted or repelled. So this change of, uh, of shape of the electron density can change the interaction properties between the polar and polariton, so it's in this quasi-particle state. And they have measured a 50 times increase of this interaction strength. Now, this is, is not very big. So, so there has been system which much larger. Uh, so, so our chairman has worked with uh, 100, which is his large, or even uh, no, larger no, maybe this is the in dipolar system. So if you, use, if you create exciton we have, which have a dipole moment or in Rydberg uh, excited state exciton. Yet uh, has been shown recently in this paper that even if this interaction is not that large, you can reach like uh, interesting blockade regimes, both conventional and unconventional. So that, that is what makes this system interesting. And another reason is that exciton and photons are neutral. They don't react to gauge fields much in some sense overall. So you cannot transport them, but if you dress them with a charge uh, bath, then polariton transport becomes possible. So that's another, that's another interesting point. Okay, so once we've done this long introduction, uh, let me also tell you that these systems have been realized. I show you here like an example from Imamoglu's group where you have your molydenium diselenide now is encapsulated. So this is, would be the real, the real system, not this schematic picture. And then you have a graphene top gate um, layer, which you can gate, you can use as a gate to gate and put in your electron gas and a cavity which um, this is an open cavity. So all these details, there are many other groups that do this. Uh, so this is ATH in Zurich. This is uh, two groups in Sheffield, in the UK. This is uh, Rana Van Bakas, I think is New York. And Menon Tambien, we know Menon Tambien is, is in New York, or maybe the Ithaca, I don't remember. Okay, so th this is similar. So what it concerns us in this talk is this schematic figure would work as well. You have the possibility to create exciton, you have a gas, you can change the density of the gas with the gate voltage, and you have a cavity to confine your photon. Okay, so now before explaining what, I mean, uh, what's the theory behind all of this, let me tell you first what people see in experiments. So I will show you uh, instead of these plots, I will show you plots, I mean, uh, these experiments, experiments in a magnetic field. So wh why I do so? Because this is the easier to interpret. So, um, so is, let's start from a case where you have weak coupling to light. It means you have no cavity. So you have just your system, you can, you can gate, volt you can have a gate voltage, so you can change the density of your electron gas or your whole gas and you measure reflectance. So, so you weakly pump your system, you see what it gets reflected or not. 
Okay, so how should I interpret these results? I see lines, I see, and I see as a function of gate voltage and energy. So let's start from this, okay? So, so here now you have a Zeeman field, which is orthogonal to the, to the layer, to the PMD layer. And this introduces a Zeeman splitting. So the spin down bands are pushed down and the spin up are pushed up. So now you have that if your gate voltage is up here, it means your chemical potential fills in both bands. But if your gate voltage, as in this dashed line, is down here, then you have a thermicity only in one valley. So this is called valley polar, is fully polarized. So it means you have a thermicity only in one valley. And now um, I can decide, of course, in this case would be the same, but now I can, so this is my gate voltage is here. Now I can pump with either sigma minus light or sigma plus. If I pump sigma minus, I create a particle interband pair in the same valley where I have the Fermi C. But if I pump sigma minus, then I create an intervalley electron hole pair, so an exciton in the opposite valley as the Fermi C. So let me use this terminology because it will help us later on. I will call this indistinguishable polarons. So indistinguishable because the electron which is created optically is indistinguishable from the electrons from the Fermi C. And I will call this distinguishable polarons because now this electron is different from the electrons of the Fermi C. It's completely distinguishable. I mean, it has a different spin, but all, most important is a different value. Okay. So what do they see here? So let, let, let's see in this uh, regime now, which is uh, n dope. So this would be a regime which is n dope. And then you see that is in this ICP, you only see a branch. And this, in this DCP, you see two branches. So, so let's focus on this DCP. If the gate voltage is in between in the neutral region, it means that you don't have a Fermi C anywhere, then this line correspond to the, corresponds to an exciton. And this evolves continuously to this branch, which is called repulsive. Repulsive because below there is another one with, with lower energy, which is called instead attractive branch. In this region, instead you only have the repulsive branch. And now we hold dope and we have like a, a different situation. So it means that now your gate voltage is down here and is below the top of the valence band. So you have a hole for me, see? And uh, okay, in this gate voltage region, you have only a Fermi C in this, in this uh, for this valley, for the K valley. So if you pump sigma minus, now you have distinguishable carriers. And if you, have, if you pump sigma plus, you have indistinguishable. And again, in the indistinguishable, you only see this repulsive branch. And in the, attract, in the DCP, you see both the attractive and the repulsive. So it turns out that if you calculate the exciton and the trion energies, then you discover that, the, of course, I mean, this, you can see this is, would be the exciton energy that this repulsive branch comes out exactly at EF equals zero from the repulsive branch. And this energy at EF equals zero corresponds to the trion. Okay, so, and in this case, you have no trion. And the other thing that you notice is that is when you are close to charge neutrality, only the exciton is bright and the attractive branch is dark. And this is because the trion is dark. But as soon as you have some EF, then the trion becomes visible for this attractive branch. And you have a transfer of oscillator strength from here to here. And the same happens in this case, just that in here, the exciton gets broadened very fast. So you don't see it very neatly. OK, so that's the experimental situation. And now we ask, is this few body physics or polaron physics? And how is this oscillator strength transferred? which is what I'm trying to, I will try to explain now. So, um, okay, um, I think, yeah. And okay, before actually going to the theory, let's also describe what happens now in strong coupling. So it means- the Francesca, new, yeah. we have a question from uh, yeah. Jan. Jan, you can just uh, unmute ah, yeah. yourself and ask. 
<clears throat> yes, uh, sorry, uh, I have a naive question from a non-expert. Yeah. So Absolutely. suppose, suppose that the, the Fermi level is in the, in the gap. Yeah. And so that would be your, I guess, distinguishable uh, carrier polaron regime. Yeah, um, I, I mean, here actually it wouldn't be anything, you know, because in this case, when mm -hmm. the, when the, the chemical potential, not the Fermi, the chemical potential is here, you see that is like, I don't, I don't have any Fermi C. This will be right. completely full. This will be completely full. This will be completely empty. This will be completely empty. So that's right. why it's called neutral. neutral. But so, then, then when you when you excite, say with light, some in steady state, wouldn't you have some finite density of electrons in the in the conduction band because you are kind of continuously pumping? Uh, so, oh, well, it depends how much. It still will be neutral because you excite as many electrons as holes. So because light right. can only excite pairs. So that right. would be like a balanced mixture of electron and holes. So you can also ask what happens there, which is an interesting question. Right, I guess my question and, is, do you, really yeah. need a, uh, do you really, really need to gate and to gate the system in order to have these many body effects or can you just pump it more strongly and also have ah. many body effects because you have a finite uh, density of uh, yeah. Of that, carriers in the yeah, that's a, that's, the a, good, that's a good question. But um, okay, so so what happens? I mean, if you pump strongly, that's that's a very good question. But so, well, okay, th this would be so if you pump strongly your system, you create as many electrons and as, as holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, there will be a regime where this is this is fully quantum. But what can be done experimentally, mostly. You, let's say you would see a semi-classical regime. So you, you can ask whether this now electron hole uh, gas can condense, for example, and that would be called elect exciton insulator. It, could, it, will be, it will condense first as pairs of excitons, which will form a BC, but then if you increase your density more, then it will form like a BCS-like state. But say that in principle, I mean, yeah, quantum regime in this, with the strong pumping are more difficult to, to achieve, or you have to have strong interaction between your excitants or your polaritons if you mix with light. So that's what people also are trying to do. Go enter this quantum regime by increasing the interaction. Okay. This is what I mean. Yeah. By okay. Either, you don't need to increase the interaction. I mean, this is, would be quantum. If you dress your, this, this Fermi energy, then it would be quantum by itself and many more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so in strong coupling, what do they see in this steel? So we have to go back to the linear regime where you pump only weakly, but what you see is now two anticrossing, one with the attractive branch and one with the repulsive branch. So, so it means that they both strongly couple to light. And this is the other experiment. This is a bit more complicated to explain because they tune the photon once in, in, in resonance with one branch and another time, so that two different pictures merged together. But here, which is a, is a, a plot as a function of cavity exit on the tuning, then you see a, a, an anticrossing with this line, which they call trium. So, and now we'll explain why you should call this polaron. Okay, so, um, okay, no, now it comes to some, some theory. So, so again, let's keep in mind this distinguishable and indistinguishable description. Either the exciton belongs to a different valley from the Fermi C or the whole, or the exciton belongs to the same valley. And let me refer to the whole dog case because, because, well, we can refer to the electron, the whole, they should be symmetric if the masses are the same, but, but we will see that they're not if the masses are not the same of the effective mass of these bands. So I will refer to the to a Fermi C, which is made by holes rather than fermions. So, okay, so, and now let's assume that the Fermi energy is almost zero. So you only have one extra hole in this band and one extra hole in this band. If it's ICP, then the two holes are indistinguishable. And this trion is called indistinguishable trion and if they are in the distinguishable case, then it will be distinguishable trion. They have complete, very, very different properties. 
So I will list the properties and then I will try to explain why they have different properties. If they are distinguishable, this also is called a singlet trion because the spin is up and down, so they can form an up and down minus an up, but we will call it distinguishable trion. Then you can demonstrate that this is has S-wave symmetry. So the orbital angular momentum is zero. The coupling to light is zero if EF is zero, and it goes linearly if you have a finite density of holes. It's always bound. And because in TMDCs, the exciton is so strongly bound, you, can, you might also approximate this exciton as a boson, as a tightly bound object, or yeah. OK, but if you are in the indistinguishable case, then I will show you that this object has a pre-wave overall symmetry. It means that the angular momentum is 1, plus or minus 1. And the, it cannot couple to light. It's strictly forbidden at EF equals 0. And if you have a finite density of holes, then the coupling to light goes quadratically instead than linearly. Usually is unbound, so it's very difficult that it binds, and it can only bind if you have a mass, a large mass ratio, so a different mass for holes and electrons, so larger for holes. And it cannot be approximated as tightly bound because uh, then, yeah, you have the, these are indistinguishable and they have Fermi Pauli blocking uh, effects that you have to take into account. So, okay, so. Briefly, how, I mean, we want to understand why this is so. So let me explain three body complexes. And I promise that these are the only two slides with equations, which usually don't go down well. So I'll keep it as simple as I can. So let's consider two holes, heavy and one electron light. So let me do something that is called born operamer approximation that for sure you have seen during one of your courses. And let's assume that the holes are infinitely heavy. Well, not always, are much heavier than the, than, than the electron. So if I want to describe the motion of the electron, I can assume that these two have no dynamics. They are infinitely heavy. And this is the wave function that describes the electron. And once I've solved this problem, I will find that this electron gives like an effective potential to now the dynamics of these particles. So, so once I've solved the problem by assuming that these two are fixed, so this is a single particle problem, and I found that this is described by this energy with the parameter r, which is the distance between the two heavy particles. Now that I can introduce back the fact that they have finite masses and solve the dynamics now for a two-body problem. So I simplify the problem from three to first one and then two. So what now what I find that I have to be careful because if these two particles are indistinguishable, I have to care about the exchange between R and minus R. And in particular, the overall wave function has to be anti-symmetric. But if these two are distinguishable, I don't care about this symmetry. That's the basics. So if I calculate this potential, I discover that only the plus solution admits a bound state. So it means that only the wave function, which is symmetric by this exchange, admits a bound state for the problem of these two particles, So, which is this uh, line. So now I solve the two particle problems. This is a nabla of a vector, which means I can now separate the modulus and the angular phi dependence. And this introduces like a like a barrier, like a centrifugal barrier. So, and in terms of the angular momentum. So, okay, so if only plus is valid, then it means that if they are indistinguishable and this has to be plus, this has to be minus, has to be anti-symmetric by the exchange of R. So it means that this wave function in the lowest state is P wave, is L is equal one. If they are indistinguishable instead, I don't care about the overall symmetry, I only have to care about the lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state is S wave and L is zero. This is also, so now I can calculate the binding energy, for example, for indistinguishable. So this would be this plot. We have done a super simplified model with contact interaction. And it actually works very well to describe this unbinding binding transition of this indistinguishable trion. So it only binds if the mass 
of the heavy particles is larger than the mass of the light particles. So the whole mass is larger than the electron mass, larger than 0, 3 by this mass ratio. Above, it doesn't, it doesn't bound, it's unbound. While the distinguishable particle uh, trion, I didn't plot it, it is always bound. The other important properties is how this couples to light. So, so the trion couples to light because an electron and a hole recombines. So the hole gets on top of the electron. So it means that one of these two distances between the hole and the electron is zero, and then you integrate. So you can show that this is the expression of the optical oscillator strength, and that it goes one, uh, one over the area. This one over the area is very important because if EF is zero, then both trions uh, have zero coupling strength to light. So, but if you have now a finite density of holes, now I have to multiply here by the number of holes. And then you can see that for the distinguishable case, this goes linearly with EF. For the indistinguishable case, this is a bit more complicated because this function also has an EF component. And you can show that this is EF squared. OK, so that's the idea. You can also do it in reciprocal space. Now, the three body object would be three uh, uh, operate, creation operators, two holes, which is one particle, and one electron. This is the wave function. It has to be anti-symmetric. You can do a P-wave ansatz, give it an angular momentum. And then you can say, how does it couple to light? Well, the Hamiltonian, the described matter-light coupling, is the absorption of a photon and the creation of one electron and one hole. So if I want to see how this couple, the trion couples to light, I can absorb an electron into a hole and uh, create a photon plus a hole, which is the other particle which is left. And if you do this calculation, then you find again this exactly this expression, but now in momentum space, in reciprocal space. So instead of rho in real space, you have k zero. And you see that you have one over square root of the area. So this would give an integral, so it's finite. And this one over square root of the area is just the fact that the particle, so the, the, elect the electron in this case that you are left with, is a plane wave. So, so this is why at zero EF, this uh, coupling strength is zero for both. And if you are in the indistinguishable case on top of that, because this wave function is anti-symmetric, then it's zero by symmetry. So coupling to light is for B. So if you have a Fermi C, you can now put here a Fermi C um, a state, and you can do calculation and show that for the indistinguishable case, then you have that this wave function goes like EF. So you have that the coupling strength to light goes as EF squared, like rather than EF, which is what we have been showing recently. Okay, so fantastic. So now we know how few body works, how polaron works in as, as a theory. So let me first describe it in word, and then I will describe it in formulas. So um, one formula. So the polaron description, I said, it means that you dress your Fermi C with particle hole, intraband particle hole excitation. So note that now your elementary excitations are the exciton you have generated, and then plus a Fermi C, and then you have a four body object. So not three, four, which is hole, hole, valence electron, and conduction electron. So this is also called trion hole, but not because the trion forms a bound state and the hole not. It's just a nomenclature, I mean, just the name. So the trion would be hole, hole, electron. And the hole here refers to the hole of the Fermi C. So he would be an electron for this case. So, so this is the natural way to study absorption in the system. Because when you do absorption, then you have an even number of pairs, you know, so, so, so this is really a natural description. The polar description is natural for describing absorption. What we are going to see, we're going to see that you can have one or two branches. It depends for the DCP, we always have two branches. For the ICP, we can have one or two branches. Then we recover few body physics if EF goes to zero, 
but we can extend these results with the polar description to finite PF. And we can explain how the oscillator strength is transferred from one branch to the other. So, so to recap, the trion is always dark. It can be visible only at finite EF, uh, which gives it a finite oscillator strength. DCP is linear, ICP is quadratic. But once EF is finite, it's not a trion anymore. Once EF is finite, it's a new quasi-particle, which are not few body particles, so neither exciton nor trions. And even though it has not been measured, it would be nice to measure, for example, the effective masses by transport and see that these are not uh, few body particles. The masses are different. So, so the right description would be in terms of polarity. OK, so theory. The theory for the distinguishable modeling has not been done by us. Mostly it's been done by Demler, um, Richard Schmidt, uh, Atashi Mamoglu, Efim King, McDonald. And, and, um, and other people. My collaborators also are in this paper in, in Australia, Mira Parish and Jesper Levinson. So, so if, you are, if you are in the distinguishable case where the exciton doesn't share the hole with the Fermi C, then the exciton, you can describe it as a bound object. So you don't put the, na the composite nature of the exciton. This is the photon. And this would be the exciton plus the particle hole pair. You can do in theory absorption spectrum by calculating the Green's function for the exciton. And this is would be in the weak coupling regime. And this means that you have to calculate the eigenvalue problem for this uh, state, which I call P3, because it has three excitation at most, I mean, three particles at most plus the Fermi C. And you have to calculate the eigenvectors associated to the exciton, and you calculate the, the Green's function. This would give absorption. So, OK. What do you see? You see two peaks. You see what you call an attractive branch. And then you see a repulsive branch, which is, tends to broaden with EF. So the, um, the, um, the energy is in terms of a frequency plus the exciton binding energy. So, so zero would be the energy of the exciton. And this is, would be in this axis, you have absorption. So, so to recap what this picture, would, the information it gives, if you plot the position of the peaks as a function of EF, you see a repulsive branch, which is this purple, and it starts from zero, which is the energy of the exciton, and a blue line, which is the attractive branch, with that zero EF recovers the energy of the trion, the distinguishable trion. So, okay, so is this zero minus zero zero five? But if you do it in MeV, that corresponds to twenty five MeV. So, great. So then um, you can calculate the coupling strength to light, and this is the area below this this uh, these curves. This is called also the residuum of the of the of the um, um, resonances. So if you do so, then you discover that most, I mean, at EF equals zero, the trion is dark, the exciton is bright. So this is one, would be one. And once you increase EF, the trion gains oscillator strength linearly with EF, as you expect, and it gets transferred from the exciton to the trion. We also have a continuum of states, which I will not get into. OK, so then you do. Uh, strong coupling. So is few body or polar? Well, if EF is zero, if few body, is EF is finite, is uh, polar. If you do strong coupling, you don't have much more information than what you have from weak coupling. But you have, so if you plot the, this would be the detuning of the photon from the exciton uh, energy. So then you see that EF is tiny is small, then you have an anti-crossing only with the exciton. This is because it doesn't have oscillator strength. The trion doesn't have oscillator strength. And you increase the F from here to here to here. And then you see that this oscillator strength is transferred. And the exciton tends to close, not only because the oscillator strength diminishes, but also because it gets broadened. So it goes to weak coupling quickly. Fantastic. So then what we have been, been done is the case of indistinguishable 
carriers, which is a bit more a pain in the neck because now you cannot assume that the exciton is tightly bound. So the exciton now is composed by a hole and an electron. This is the photon. And then your dressed state is the hole, the electron, the interband hole, interband electron, and now the intraband pair, which is the hole and the electron from the valence band. So now these two particles are indistinguishable. This you have to assume, you have to ensure that this is anti-symmetric. And, and so what you discover when you calculate absorption for this state is that you have now either one peak or two peaks. If the mass, so for TMDs, the mass is one, and you have only one peak. And this is because we remember that the, the trion is not bound. But if you lower, if you go to larger mass imbalance, which is possible for other systems like uh, gallium arsenide, or you might think a way to engineer uh, a mass, um, effective mass change, then you see two peaks. One we call attractive and one we call the repulsive. So if I plot absorption now as a function of EF, now vertically, then you see that the attractive branch or the trion energy is the right one, but is dark. And you have this transfer of to strength like in the other case, but is lower. So if you do, if I do calculate Z, we find a quadratic increase as we do expect if the mass ratio is more. Otherwise we only have one single branch. So the oscillator is lower. And now we have something interesting that we found, which is that we can calculate the orbital character of the trion part. So only this part of this four body object. So in, in reality, we calculate the orbital character of the whole, so of this uh, quantity. But because we know that the overall, this overall object is L equals zero, then the trion will have orbital character opposite than the whole. When we do so, then we discover that only IF equals zero, this three body object is P wave for the attractive branch and is S wave for the repulsive branch. But as soon as EF is increasing, then you have a change of orbital character. So, so as soon as EF is zero, this Polaron state, which we call M4, because now has four, at most four bodies, is not a few body state, is a, is a really different, completely different object. Okay, so basically I finished um, with my, with the theory, which we have been done and very quickly, we can wonder, okay, but have been this indistinguishable trion or, tri or polaron have been observed. Well, the answer is no in TMDCs, not yet, though it's not impossible, but in this picture that I show you from this experiment, if we are in the ICP case, which would be sigma minus and dope, you, have, you see only one branch. So, so there is only the repulsive branch. And if we do a P dope, which would be here ICP and sigma plus, this would be only single branch. This is because the mass ratio probably is uh, between electron holes is too close to one. But in gallium arsenide, in fact, this triplet trion, or what I would call indistinguishable trion, it has been observed a long time ago. So I had to go back and dig out these papers from Bar Joseph's group in Israel. And I think this is David Ritchie in, in Cambridge where you see the trion, the triple trion appearing. And this is our calculations from Juanjo Palacio, Alan McDonald, and uh, David Whittaker. Actually, this, this picture is from David Whittaker paper, where you see that if the in gallium arsenide, if you apply a magnetic field, then the triple trion binds and even can overcome the singlet one. So what we would call distinguishable, indistinguishable trion, this would be the distinguishable trial. So it's not impossible. And there has been an old experiment by Daniele Sambito when he was in Cambridge, where he actually observed by increasing the density here in this case of electrons, then you can see um, the transfer of oscillator strength. 
in presence of a magnetic field to the triplet trion. And so we have been trying to see if this is was quadratic and is not. So, so I think more is not, no, I don't remember whether it was, well, it's super linear, it's not linear, but it's not quadratic. So I think more experiments should be done in this. Okay, so let me conclude. And uh, what I've been telling you about is about why I think this 2D polaron in semiconductors are exciting. So why one should look at electronic doping and strong matter light coupling. And the problem that I've been telling you about is few body complexes, so excitons and trions, which describe these systems at f equals zero, but uh, at the f finite, you should talk about polaron, uh, the polaron problem. So in fact, this is a much bigger um, problem at, um, at larger EF, this is connected to a problem which is called Fermi edge singularity. So, so and, and the orthogonality to catastrophe, which we have been not looked at. And also connected to the question that Ian made before, you might also wonder uh, beyond the um, dressing of the Fermi C, whether you can have interesting collective paired phases. So in this system, so it means you can ask whether how the exciton pair to the gas without dressing it. And we have been working on this in, in this work and we, we found that and, and how coupling to the light can affect this pairing. And in another work, we have been looking at the problem where you pump more strongly. And so you have an imbalance electron hole gas plus a photon. And we have discovered in this work that the pairing properties collective in the sense of like many body uh, then um, can give rise to a state which breaks rotational symmetry and time reversal symmetry. And you have pairing everywhere but the sliver which is asymmetric. So we call this bridge pairing. Well, not us actually, we call this crescent state, but is a form of bridge pairing, which is known in the literature. Okay, so, so this work has been done mostly by Antonio Tiene, who is a PhD student here at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, Jonathan Keating in St. Andrews in the UK, Mira Perish in Monash, Australia and Melbourne, and Jesper Levinson also there. And the part that I didn't talk about, which is this exact exotic collective pairing has been done in collaboration with Artem Strashko, who was a student by Jonathan now in Flight Iron, which is this second publication and also Alan McDonald at the University of Texas posted. Thank you. Great, thank you, Francesca. Uh, so uh, we have time for questions. Uh, first question is, uh, I saw Felix uh, raise his hand. So Felix, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, thanks a lot, Stefan. Uh, and thanks a lot, Francesca, for the, uh, the amazing talk. That was uh, more than I, I could handle at the moment, uh, having thought of trions as a three-particle body for all of my existence. Now it's a new world that opens to me. Um, I have a question regarding these... Um, uh, these Fermi C excitations that you've mentioned. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure I quite get <clears throat> why these should appear there. Are, are these uh, thermal excitations that happen? What is their nature and why do you need to consider oh, no. them? Um, oh, no, I mean, this is, yeah, this is, this is just, okay, let me go back. This could be zero temperature. So this is not thermal, is, is interaction induced. So, so, okay, so let's say here. So, um, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't need temperature. Of course, temperature can have an effect, you know, but mostly at the beginning would be on the occupation. So how you occupy, uh, so I'm not saying that temperature is not important, but you, yeah, of course, if you have temperature, you not only sharply occupy your Fermi C up to the Fermi momentum and the Fermi energy, but you have a tail and, uh, and also, yeah, the holes that you generate can be generated uh, every, everywhere. So no, it's not temperature. If you do zero temperature, it would be the same. So it's in interaction induced. So, so it's just due to the Coulomb term between your unoccupied state of the top of the balance band and these that are uh, exactly. occupied by electrons. Is that right? Exactly so. 
I see. Okay, well, thanks a lot. That clarifies Thank it. Thanks. I saw another hand from uh, Ion, but I don't know if it's the previous hand. Ion, did you have a question? Yes, uh, yes, I have a question. Um, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I had a question about the uh, the slide where you invoked the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And, uh, and so, yeah, yeah, that one. And so there, the statement is that the the, the motion of the of the electron, the light, light electron, if I see it correctly, creates some kind of effective potential for the, for the heavy holes. Exactly, yes. Okay, yeah. but actually it turns out the, well, that one can go slightly beyond this usual born of the hammer approximation. And one can see that normally uh, it's not just only the effective potential, but there is also a vector potential that is produced. Uh, so there, for example, in your Laplacian, uh, uh, there could be also a vector potential induced by uh, by the light particle on the heavy on the heavy particles, and that vector potential is just the very is the uh, is the very connection. Mm. Uh, so this, I think that in, at least in some molecular physics, it leads to changes in the spectrum. Uh, yeah, I mean the spectrum is not calculated this way, so I okay. use this way as an argument. So see, not, see. not not to say not not to, so I, the spectrum is calculated exactly. So I see, this, I see, I see. this is a three-body problem. So you just diagonalize. I mean, so you let me go to the next one. So you, you do your answers with a three-body project, and you calculate your Hamiltonian, in, and, and you calculate your energy by direct diagonalization. So, so, okay, okay. Okay. so this is just an argument that I use to explain why this should be P-wave. So just not to, to assume it, you know, just because okay. I say it. You know, so this is is a is a way to simplify this this okay, okay. problem and to say okay if if this electron can give me binding for the holes mm -hmm. only in the symmetric solution because I calculate it and I see that only the symmetric has a negative energy with respect to the binding energy of the exciton so that would be this minus one so uh, then if this is forced to be symmetric then if these two are indistinguishable, this has to be antisymmetric. So if this is antisymmetric, then it's like a cosine, you know, it's like, so it has a node in the middle. So the, the lowest energy is P wave, and this node in the middle is what causes the coupling strength to light to be zero. It's like just by symmetry is exactly zero if I don't have a Fermi C. So that, that's an argument. So it's just a simplified argument. So you're right that to calculate the, the energy, then you should do exactly okay, okay. calculation with all everything. I mean, these two have a dynamics which influence the electron as well, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question, Ion. So maybe to follow up on Ion, if I understood <laughs> his question correctly, um, and I mean, looking at this, I would imagine that there would be also and it's the tropic effects in the K space that are arising or perhaps even topological effects uh, induced by the coupling. So do you see those? Uh, I, I didn't quite um, um, oh, see okay, you go so into that. Let's see, let's see if I can answer. So in, I mean, indeed, um, if I do in momentum space, well, in momentum space, the real space would be exactly the same. But if, it, if I go in momentum space, so if I, well, of course, when I diagonalize this problem, I don't have to make this assumption that the trion is P wave. I just diagonalize and see if the lowest energy is P wave. And I find out that, yes, it's P wave. So once I discover that, then I can do these answers to simplify later on my uh, calculation and say that this is as L equal one angular momentum. So, so if I look at this expression and the, and the angular dependence, when I calculate the coupling strength to light, then I mean I can I can I can see easily that this is zero because when I integrate on the angular part, this would give a zero expectation value. So maybe it's not that easy to see it in this expression, but if I do um, so, um, yeah, if I yeah if I calculate this uh, the equation that governs this expression, then I find that is strictly zero. Uh, because of symmetry, so 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 this P wave nature. Uh, so not only the trion goes like one over the square root of the area. Okay, fine, because it generates like a free particle. 
but also by symmetry, I cannot couple to light. So, so now we're asking other consequences of this P wave um, behavior um, apart from binding. So, um, so, well, when you calculate the polar in indeed, I mean, we see that the, the, well, now how you would measure that, that would be difficult. But theoretically, it means that this polaron has a, say, or, or better said, the whole component of this polaron has a P wave component, and this one has a SES wave component. So, and they switch between them, the switch component. So, now, consequences of that, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Practical consequences. Hmm. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you. So I had a question uh, regarding uh, actually an experimental result we showed earlier on. You showed this uh, result uh, from the group of a Dutch. Mm -hmm. where they um, show that there's a, a stronger nonlinearity for the attractive polaron ah, mm -hmm. for the exciton. Yes. So here you looked at the linear optics and the dependence yes. of oscillator strength on Fermi level. Yes. Um, can you so how would can you understand just based on what you've done the emergence of this stronger nonlinearity? And if not, hmm. what would need to be done? Well, I mean, my, 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 yeah, my work was a calculation at the single particle. I mean, I understand this cartoon. So um, now it, it is, I mean, it is, I mean, it's also true that the, um, the, the theory, you know, the, the interaction properties of the attractive branch and the repulsive branch would be, yeah, would be very different. So they, they measure only one, one of the two. So the theory we've done is linear properties. So it means single particle in that, I mean, it's not single particles, it's four body particles, but, but it's single in the sense one polar. So um, yeah, I mean, especially for indistinguishable, we would expect strong nonlinearities coming from the addition that you have strong Pauli blocking effects, but we didn't calculate that. We, we would like to do that. So we are, we are planning to do that. It's a, it's a next step. Uh, so you have to take this, objects and then you have to calculate say two. Two of them, uh, yeah, like a two X. Yeah. yeah, so then you can imagine that this becomes eight plus, a, plus two for me. So, yeah. Another PhD student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, and just a, a question uh, sort of from a historical perspective. So all of this in theory was also true for highly doped quantum wells and you also showed some results for gallium arsenide. Why is it only now that people are using this uh, Fermi Polaron description. Do you have some idea of what was sort of missed historically? Or... Yeah, actually, yeah. That's a, it is a good question, no? because trions in gallium arsenide have been known for yeah, decades. So, so probably then, I don't know if there are many studies which do the oscillator strength transfer. So, so what do you study? The density dependence of, of, of the system, like in this, in this case. And, and, and also because, I mean, so far, yeah, if you don't probe things like the effective mass, so if you don't look at transport, it would be uh, less easy to differentiate. I've seen actually a paper yesterday, I think it was is Nature, is Nature Communication, and maybe, maybe you know them, this is Chung Hung Lui, the last author, so which they do excited states. So they do exit on polaron Rydberg states up to the 3S. So I found this very interesting and, um, and they claim, but I have to read it carefully, that this cannot be explained by the few bodies. So it has to be polar on, or oh yes, or oh yes. So yeah, that, that, that I thought it was interesting. So maybe that would be the answer. I can pass you the paper. I didn't see it before. Any other questions? So in that case, uh, thank you, Francesca, for the, the talk. Thank you.